European Regional Forum on Minority Issues. It is my honor to welcome you all this morning to what we all hope will be a very productive couple of days. This is the second European Regional Forum on Minority Issues convened since the establishment of the annual Forum on Minority Issues by the Human Rights Council in Geneva, the first to be held entirely online. I would like to thank in particular the UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues, Dr. Fernand de Varenne, for organizing the regional forum with the support of the Federal Ministry of the Republic of Austria. It is my pleasure to first give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Alexander Schallenberg, Austrian Federal Minister for European and International Affairs, to deliver his opening remarks. His Excellency's statement will be provided by video. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Special Rapporteur, 75 years ago, the world cautiously rose from the horrors and the destruction of the Second World War. Humanity had experienced the darkest abyss of racial hate and discrimination. One might hope that we have learned from history, but it seems we haven't done so enough. Discrimination and hatred against minorities of all kinds continue to poison our societies. What is more, modern media have made it even easier to spread hate speech. What was mumbled in a dark corner yesterday is today presented without hesitation to a broad public via Facebook, Twitter, or other social media. Around the world, we are witnessing a disturbing rise of xenophobia, racism, and intolerance, including rising anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim hatred, and persecution of Christians. Recent surveys of the European Union Fundamental Rights Agency prove that fear and resentment of ethnic minorities are also rising on our own continent. As the Austrian philosopher Karl Popper once stated, and I quote, if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed and tolerance with them. We therefore simply cannot stand by and remain silent. We have to actively defend our values and our open societies against this onslaught. Thus, Austria has placed the promotion and the protection of rights of minorities at the center of its human rights agenda. The vast majority of defamation, hate speech, including even instigation of violence, are generated online. That is where we have to start our work. We must act more decisively against the misuse of social media for spreading hatred and inciting violence. In Austria, the fight against online hate speech is an essential part of our government program. A legislative proposal is currently being prepared and is in the face of public consultation. Its aim is to place more responsibility on social media providers to monitor and quickly erase hateful content. It will extend the application of the criminal offence incitement of hatred also to individuals and it will reduce the legal costs of lawsuits, a burden that in practice has often kept victims of online hate speech from going to court to defend themselves. Our objective is clear. It is to better protect victims of online hate speech and hate crimes and to strengthen me measures against cyberbullying. However, new laws are necessary but not sufficient. Non-legislative measures are equally essential in supporting social cohesion, integration and understanding. We have, among others, implemented awareness-raising campaigns in Austria, including the Council of Europe's initiative No Hate Speech. The centre, hashtag Gegen Hass im Netz, against online hate, offers free counselling for victims and witnesses of online hate. And we have developed a nationwide strategy for the prevention and countering of violent extremism and de-radicalization that contains a number of concrete measures to address phenomena leading to violence within our societies. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Special Rapporteur, all our societies are facing the same challenge. Therefore, it is all the more important to communicate and to share our approaches and best practices. One thing, however, has to be crystal clear. The protection and the respect of human rights of minorities is non-negotiable. We have to prove that we have learned from history. 
otherwise history might repeat itself. And the hope that we will again be able to meet in person at the European Regional Forum on Minorities in Vienna next year, I thank you for your attention. Thank you for this important statement and insightful remarks. I now would like to give the floor to Snezhana Samardzic Markovic, Director General of Democracy, Council of Europe. Thank you very much, uh, Director Biro, Madam, uh, Excellencies, uh, distinguished speakers, uh, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure, of course, and thank you, thank you for the opportunity <clears throat> to address this forum um, on a very timely and important topic. It is a, it is a daunting challenge uh, to find um, a balanced uh, but yet effective approach to addressing hate speech, uh, but we need to succeed and the fundamental rights and, uh, uh, of individuals uh, and the health of our democracies uh, depend on it. Okay, hate speech concerns us all, but particularly those from a minority background who are disproportionately targeted uh, uh, by hate speech, which, uh, uh, which uh, uh, limits then their freedom of expression hinders their well-being and sometimes even threatens their lives. People belonging to visible, linguistic, sexual and other minorities face additional uh, barriers uh, to seeking redress against hate speech offenses. And they do not always feel uh, the solidarity they deserve from wider society. The Council of Europe as a continent's uh, leading human rights body has worked for many years uh, with and for the protection of human rights of members of minorities, minority communities. The Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities is a key instrument in this area. And the monitoring process of the convention has evidenced uh, uh, very high levels of hate speech against uh, refugees, uh, migrants, and um, other visible minorities. Less often, but equally disturbing for the vic victims, hate speech circulates also against traditional, well-established minorities. Particularly worrying is that uh, political representatives often uh, fail to condemn hate speech or even worse, they post uh, hateful messages uh, themselves. Such rhetoric uh, from elected representatives is a threat to democracy because uh, it, uh, this way, the, it this way it's uh, persons belonging to minorities to voice their views and it makes uh, societies more divided and, and violent. Um, the Advisory Committee on the Framework Convention has also observed uh, hate speech uh, uh, in the context of uh, memory politics. Social media, as the minister uh, just said, are full of arguments about uh, right or wrong interpretation of history, national heroes, monuments, and memorial days. Unfortunately, a, a tweet does not allow for untangling the complexity of European history and different perspectives on it. Though, though these different perspectives is exactly what we need, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, so the House Council of Europe has a program for media literacy and intercultural education, as well as uh, uh, for multi-perspectivity in history teaching, which deliver results uh, if deployed on a sufficiently large uh, scale, of course. Aware of the importance uh, of history and its teaching for Europe, and based on the achievement of this uh, mentioned uh, decade-long program in the field of history teaching, uh, we in the Council of Europe, uh, we are finalizing uh, the establishment of an observatory for history teaching in Europe. Now, <clears throat> strategies to address hateful narratives with human rights and inclusion narratives as well as strategies to bring people together for a respectful and informed debate are also approaches that work. 
we have piloted and validated some very effective methodologies in this respect, uh, uh, such as the anti-rumors uh, uh, approach. Uh, it is in the context uh, of our intercultural cities program that we tried, and it was successful, and it still is, I mean. Roma and travelers are among the groups uh, which suffer the most uh, from hate speech. Media remain, remain hostile to them. And in most of the cases, they paint a negative image of Roma based on stereotypes. The European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, uh, and the president will address you later on, has expressed concern about the widespread problem of racist and intolerant hate speech uh, towards Roma in uh, several countries. The Council of Europe Strategic Action Plan for Roma and Travelers Inclusion tackles the issue of hate speech against Roma through a comprehensive framework on, on anti-gypsism. ECRI has noted that member states uh, 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 also uh, uh, have among uh, 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 vulnerable groups, uh, inc including national minorities, uh, migrants and LGB LGBTI, uh, have lack of understanding uh, uh, in member states. Uh, they have lack of understanding of their rights and are reluctant uh, to report hate speech and discrimination. This limits the availability of data on the magnitude of the problem and undermines our ability to understand how to address it. We are working on setting up efficient, disaggregated data collection in several Council of Europe member states uh, in order to address this challenge. And needless to say, the COVID uh, uh, pandemic uh, has only uh, accelerated the problem. Existing inequalities have become even more enforced and made it uh, more difficult to uh, mount an effective response uh, to the crisis. For example, uh, there has been insufficient information in minority languages and uh, uh, all the discriminatory, discriminatory hate narratives have been uh, recast into new messages. Um, enhanced uh, conspiracy theories and new disinformation campaigns have seriously undermined efforts to inform and protect our society against the pandemic, pitching communities against each other and worsening the reality of many people in a disadvantaged uh, situation. <clears throat> the Council of Europe has been working for decades on helping national authorities, including courts, to find the right balance between protecting freedom of expression and protecting the victims of hate speech. And we, we haven't found it yet. <laughs> the evolving case law of the European Court of Human Rights and ECRI's uh, General Policy Recommendation 15 give guidance on how to find such a balance, including through measures such as awareness raising, prevention, self-regulation, which uh, complements our toolbox of measures uh, to address hate speech. Binding standards have been developed, for example, uh, through the additional protocol uh, to the Cybercrime Convention, according to which the 29 member states who have ratified this treaty are obliged to criminalize certain forms of hate speech, such as um, dissemination of uh, racist and xenophobic uh, material through computer systems, which is Article 3 of that protocol. Now, gender often intersects, it intersects with other grounds of discrimination. Um, so we in Council of Europe, uh, uh, we have produced the new standards uh, on sexism adopted by the Committee of Ministers uh, uh, last year. Therefore, uh, 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 that one addresses uh, specifically the situation of uh, women from minority background. 
And uh, the minister just mentioned uh, uh, something also very important, na uh, namely the Council of Europe Youth Campaign, No Hate Speech Movement, which is a concrete example on how best to inform citizens uh, of the risk hate speech uh, poses uh, to human rights and democracy and how to mobilize them to stand up for human rights online. Now, <clears throat> public authorities have a particular responsibility to help communities address hate speech incidents by providing fair information about the incidents, um, its harmful effects um, and the measures taken to redress them. Such actions can help dispel rumors and uh, address misgivings as well as provide support to the victims. An inclusive community is not only supportive and understanding of the needs of both the victims of hate speech and of the society as a whole, but it also will be able to prevent escalations and to strengthen resilience to overcome hates, uh, hate incidents uh, when they do take place. So based on its uh, uh, multi-dimensional, dimensional, long-standing experience uh, with fighting hate speech, the Council of Europe uh, believes that uh, a comprehensive strategy is essential. This requires an interdisciplinary approach and coordination between a range of institutions as well as civil society and, uh, and internet intermediaries. So to this effect, uh, a new Council of Europe Committee of Experts has been tasked to draft a new standard on a comprehensive approach to combat hate speech within a human rights framework. I'm confident uh, that the uh, deliberations and the sharing of uh, promising practices over the next days will give uh, a valuable input uh, to the work uh, of the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on the minority uh, issues, as well as, of course, us, the Council of Europe. So I look forward to this uh, forum's results uh, and to our uh, continued cooperation. So thank you, Madam Director. Thank you, Mrs. Magic Markovic, uh, for your insightful and comprehensive statement. And uh, I now would like to give the floor to Mrs. Birgit van Hoek, Regional Representative for Europe, UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Thank you very much. Dear government representatives, representatives of regional organizations, experts, civil society, and minority representatives. Dear Special Rapporteur, it is a great honor for me to take the floor at this European Regional Forum on Hate Speech, Social Media, and Minorities. And I would like to thank in particular Special Rapporteur Fernand de Varenne for organizing this meeting together with the Tom Lantus Institute. I participated in last year's forum on education, language, and the human rights of minorities, celebrating Europe's linguistic diversity. This year's seminar also deals with language, but from a very different angle. Today and tomorrow, we will be discussing language that hurts, diminishes, humiliates, and in its worst form, incites to hostility or even violence. As the UN Secretary General has said, during COVID-19, we have witnessed a tsunami of hate, xenophobia, and scaremongering against stigmatized groups, many of whom were already facing the disproportionate impact of the health and economic crisis. The history of Europe and the experience of the United Nations around the world have taught us that the failure to effectively address hate speech exacerbates human rights violations and creates an enabling environment for atrocity crimes. Pledging to tackle hate speech wherever it occurred, the UN Secretary General launched in June 2019 the UN Strategy and Plan of Action on Hate Speech. The working definition of hate speech used in this document is any kind of communication in speech writing or behavior that attacks or uses 
pejorative or discriminatory language with reference to a person or a group on the basis of one or more identity factors. The plan of action, which applies to the entire UN system, seeks a more effective response to hate speech and a greater effort to tackle the root causes that are allowing hate speech to proliferate at the rate we are currently witnessing. Addressing hate speech is indeed a matter of urgency, and there is an increasing impetus to respond with legislative initiatives. I personally had the pleasure earlier this month of attending the first meeting of the Steering Committee on Anti-Discrimination, Diversity and Inclusion set up by the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, which has a mandate to develop guidelines on hate speech, as we just heard. A regional office also follows closely the EU's Digital Services Act, which will impact on the problem of hate speech, even though its overall scope is much broader. To ensure legal certainty for member states and domestic courts, it is important that new legal instruments are in line with international human rights law, standards, and the jurisprudence developed by the UN treaty bodies over decades. Models from Europe are often copied in other parts of the world. In the face of a weakening rule of law in many places and a global backlash against human rights, we need to be cautious that hate speech laws and standards are not abused to curtail dissent, as has sometimes happened with counterterrorism legislation. But what does international human rights law say about hate speech? Let me start by saying that there is no legal definition of hate speech in international law. International law does protect freedom of opinion, which can never be restricted, however much we may disagree with the opinion. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights also protect freedom of expression. Another foundational principle of international human rights law is that of equality and non-discrimination. And we know from the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action of 1993 that all human rights are interdependent and indivisible. The Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination of the United Nations has expressed that the dichotomy between freedom of expression on the one hand and the right to equality and non-discrimination on the other was a fallacy. It is not a zero-sum game where upholding one right necessarily implies diminishing the other. But there is nevertheless a tension between freedom of expression and protection against discrimination and hate. And this is precisely why international law places a few narrowly defined boundaries on freedom of expression. The question is then, at which point does free speech become hate speech? And what should the legal and judicial response be? In the second paragraph of Article 20 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which all European countries have ratified, it is mandated that what we may call the top level of hate speech, namely advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence must be prohibited by law because of the severity of the harm. And I quote, intermediate level of hate speech is dealt with in Article 19, Paragraph 3 of the same treaty. It allows for possible but not mandatory legal restrictions on freedom of expression to protect the rights or reputation of others. It is not always straightforward to qualify hate speech, which is essential to determine the appropriate legal or judicial response. This is why the UN Human Rights Office engaged in a two-year process to develop a framework of six criteria to help policymakers and judges assess between the three types of hate speech, which speech should be outlawed and face criminal, civil, or administrative sanctions, which speech may be restricted, provided the restriction meets the criteria of legality, legitimacy, necessity, and proportionality, and when free speech, even if, if hurtful, 
must be upheld and protected. And this threshold test is captured in the Rabat Plan of Action. In the last case, when offensive speech does not reach the intermediate or top level, the United Nations supports more speech, not less, to tackle hate speech. Promoting more speech means promoting alternative and positive speech narratives. This brings me to my next point, which goes to say that there are a multitude of non-legal responses that can and should be given in response to hate speech, like public campaigns against stereotyping, ending segregation in schools and housing, so people actually interact with minorities, human rights education, and the promotion of media pluralism with a diversity of content and staff. As we've heard from previous speakers, some political leaders relentlessly search for scapegoats for electoral gain, rather than promoting dignity and dialogue. In some countries, hatred has penetrated mainstream politics. As public figures, political leaders have the power to shape the debate and to shift public opinion, either positively or negatively. This is why they carry a special responsibility to refrain from hate speech and to speak out for, firmly and promptly against it. Last year, our office brought together EU officials, human rights defenders, and social media representatives for a dialogue. The first part was dedicated to sharing experiences of how to effectively use social media to mobilize for human rights and build coalition because social media has a huge potential in this area. But social media is also an enabler of hate speech, which has amplified exponentially in the digital sphere. In the second part of our dialogue, human rights defenders shared shocking testimony about the hatred they were receiving on social media, which was even worse in the case of women. In many instances, vicious and personal attacks by anonymous persons were taking a toll on their well being and that of their colleagues. In some cases, it was leading to self censorship or even people leaving the sector. I'm sharing this experience because most participants were representing or speaking on behalf of minority groups in society. In the European context, the problem of increasing hate speech is thus closely linked to the problematic shrinking of civic space. Our office is working with Facebook to explore how the six part threshold test can help to root their content moderation policies in international human rights law. In cooperation with Facebook, the threshold test on incitement to hatred from the Rabat plan of action was translated in 32 languages. Last week, you and High Commissioner for Human Rights Bachelet sent a letter to European Commission President von der Leyen in the context of the consultations on the EU Digital Services Act. She called for greater transparency on the rules and mechanisms used to moderate online content. She also expressed concern for members of at-risk and marginalized communities and called for the new law to protect their rights to effective and accessible remedies. Indeed, the same rights that people have offline must be protected online. Again, it will therefore be vital to ensure that any regulations which touch upon freedom of expression are firmly rooted in international human rights law. Addressing hate speech requires a comprehensive approach that also tackles the root causes and drivers of hate speech and measures its impact on victims and societies more broadly. I welcome the EU Anti-Racism Action Plan 2020 to 2025 that was presented by the European Commission to the other EU institutions just a few days ago. We hope that it will lead to the adoption of national action plans against racism across the continent, which states committed to almost 20 years ago in the Declaration and Program of Action adopted at the World Conference Against Racism in Durban in 2001. I would like to emphasize that such national action plans require a genuine dialogue with all sectors of society, for only an action plan with broad buy-in can be effective. We are living a critical time in history, with ever larger pockets of the population in Europe appearing to have become deaf to the suffering and pain of others, 
desensitized to exclusion and buying into stereotypical myths. I would like to say a few words about the difference between integration and inclusion. Many integration programs tend to focus on minorities and what they must do in order to belong. Increasingly, as with the EU Roma framework, it has become clear that when programs address only the target of discrimination and not the victimizer, the results will be mixed at best and poor at worst. Any program aimed at empowering minorities and overcoming discrimination and prejudice against them by the majority needs to address structural discrimination and prejudice against minorities by the majority population. Currently, preconceived stereotypes act as powerful barriers that prevent minorities from being included, no matter how empowered, no matter how educated, no matter how prosperous. It takes two to tango. And this also means practicing what we preach. We need to open our institutions and organizations to persons of a minority background and embrace diversity beyond speeches. The UN Human Rights Office has a fellowship program since 2005, which by now counts 500 minority and indigenous fellows worldwide. In conclusion, states have the obligation under international human rights law to act against incitement to discrimination, hostility, and violence while respecting freedom of expression. Following a human rights approach, it is essential that minorities themselves and civil society at large are consulted and participate in the shaping of laws, policies, or programs to confront hate speech. And this requires an open civic space. And prevention is critical. Also there, there is much that states and cities can and are doing, but we all have a role to play. Civil society organizations can raise alarm because at grassroots level, they are closer to the people. And as informed individuals, all of us can stand up for human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Van Hoot, for this very insightful and heartfelt statement. And I would like to give the floor to Mr. Michal O'Flaherty, Director of the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights. Thank you very much, uh, Director Birol, Special Rapporteur. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, I'm very grateful for the invitation to participate in this forum, albeit I have to start with a rather uh, gloomy entry point, which is that within the European Union, we have a serious problem of hate speech and hate crime against minorities. In some cases, the situation is getting worse, not better. We know that at the Fundamental Rights Agency because of our surveys, the ones mentioned already by the minister earlier this morning, we conduct periodic surveys of key minority groups within the EU, including uh, those of migrant origin, Muslims, Sub-Saharan Africans, the Jewish community, the LGBTI community, uh, and Roma and travelers, just to take some examples. We also know from our work that the situation is much worse than is reported in official data. We know that only something like one in 10 incidents are reported. And we're aware through our research that there is a wide gap in the appreciation of the problem between impacted groups and the general population. Take, for example, anti-Semitism. When we ask the Jewish community how bad the problem is, they 90% say it's a serious concern. When the EU asks the general population, just 50% say it's a serious concern. We welcome the framing of today's discussion because a primary context of hate speech and hate crime today is indeed uh, on social media. Uh, I would also join with our friends from the Council of Europe in strongly emphasizing the extent to which this is a problem impacting women more than men. And again, uh, we have identified this through our research that the forms of hate speech and hate crime, the manner in which they're directed at uh, target women to uh, a worrying degree. I would also join with earlier speakers who pointed out the extent to which COVID has exacerbated problems. We're following this very closely. We are publishing periodic bulletins on fundamental rights and COVID-19, four so far, one coming up next week, focusing on the particular experience of Roma and we see the way certain groups are targeted 
for intensified hate uh, in, in this strange time. You will recall that the Chinese community, or those perceived to be Chinese, were the recipients of much hate earlier in the pandemic, but since then also migrants and members of the Jewish community have been targeted. Let me finally, though in the context of COVID, uh, also share some words of hope. As well as problems, we also see impressive signals of a resilience and a goodwill in our European societies, as demonstrated repeatedly over recent months, an important uh, base on which to build progress. Now, let me turn briefly to the engagement of the European Union uh, in, this, uh, in, in our context today. And I, I, I would stress that it is very important to take account of the EU actions in order to measure the reality on the ground within the 27 EU member states because, of course, of the supranational nature of the European Union and the elements of shared sovereignty. Let me take first uh, law. Uh, I would put as, the, um, as the, uh, the, the basis for all of the relevant EU law, of course, the EU's Charter of Fundamental Rights, our Magna Carta, which lays out, uh, in essence, all of the core commitments. But then in more detailed legislation, uh, I would mention the framework decision on racism and xenophobia, the audiovisual audio media services directive, and of course, uh, the uh, very important instrument that uh, Brigitte has mentioned just a moment ago, the upcoming Digital Services Act. But let me turn to policy. Uh, many of the participants in today's meeting will be aware of the European Commission Code of Conduct on countering illegal hate speech online, uh, which is in the form of a pact with the major social media platforms. But very importantly, right now in this period, this year, there are multiple additional strategies, either in place or in development. And again, I welcome that Birgit already made express mention of, and I couldn't emphasize enough, the importance of the anti-racism plan of action, which bears close study. And uh, I would welcome to see be adequately reflected in the United Nations reflections uh, on the situation within the EU 27 member states. But there are a number of other critically important strategies also in development right now. Let me mention by way of example, the strategy on Roma uh, and on, uh, the, uh, for the LGBTI community. Turning more specifically back to the uh, Fundamental Rights Agency, uh, we will continue on a periodic basis to conduct our large scale surveys of the experience of minorities. We will continue all of the related socio-legal research. We will further intensify our programs of capacity building with impacted communities and with EU member states. Uh, and we will continue to innovate in terms of our new projects going forward. For instance, to mention one of direct relevance for today's discussion, uh, we will roll out a major uh, research in 2021 uh, on patterns of online content moderation in terms of impacted groups and how the moderators act in response to the perceived um, hate speech that they detect on their platforms. To wrap up my observations this morning, I, I would like to mention just four actions uh, relevant and common to all of us, to all actors, and indeed some of them have already been mentioned uh, just now. The first is that whatever we do, whoever we are, we must work with and not for impacted groups. We must work in partnership to better understand, better engage, and be more impactful, indeed be more respectful and more impactful. Secondly, working with impacted groups, there are many ways in, we, in which we can support such groups to be further empowered. Uh, and a, a very critical dimension of this empowerment would be the imparting of key skills, such as media literacy, and also uh, encouraging uh, heightened levels of reporting to authorities, which then, of course, raises another issue of building trust uh, in the reporting authorities. That brings me to the role of the state. We have to take within our respective roles and mandates uh, all appropriate action to strengthen the capacity of states to monitor hate speech, to record it, to investigate it, and where it crosses the uh, lines of illegality to prosecute it. And fourth and finally, uh, let me conclude by recalling that 
the problem of hate speech and hate crime directed against minorities is not the problem of minorities. It's our problem. It's a problem of our societies. And we must heavily invest uh, in working with our general population. We must invest further in education and in public information uh, for tolerant, inclusive, diverse societies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. O'Flaherty, uh, for this sobering yet hopeful call to action, emphasizing participation of minorities in countering hate speech targeted at them. Thank you very much again. And now I would like to give the floor to Mrs. Maria Daniela Maruda, Chair of the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Director, um, Excellencies, distinguished speakers, dear participants. It is my pleasure to take part in this important meeting and speak about what can be done to stem hate speech. This is a topic which is at the very core of the mandate of the Council of Europe's Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, better known by its acronym, MECRI. Hate speech is a clear manifestation of intolerance in any context and quite often also an expression of racism. It is often minorities who are at the receiving end of hate speech and it is often in present times committed using social media as a channel. I deliberately use the, the term committed as in committing a crime. ECRI's position is that criminal prohibition of hate speech is necessary to the extent that it publicly incites to violence against individuals or groups of people, which unfortunately is all too often the case. As you know, ECRI standards already mentioned by Snezana, Markovic, which form the basis of our monitoring work, are currently constituted by our 16 general policy recommendations. And specifically, General policy recommendation number 15 on combating hate speech, which remains a state-of-the-art tool to address contemporary forms of hate speech, including online. In this context, I should mention two other at-risk recommendations, which are also relevant in the context of fighting hate speech, namely general policy recommendation number five on combating intolerance and discrimination against Muslims, and general policy recommendation number nine on the fight against antisemitism. These are highly relevant tools in the work against hate speech directed at the two groups of people concerned, but nonetheless, these two instruments are at the moment undergoing facelifts, to use an analogy from the car industry, to become even more relevant in contemporary efforts against hate speech. ECRI, aims at presenting the updated models by the end of next year. The victims of anti-Muslim hatred or anti-Semitism are by no means the only ones to be at the receiving end of hate speech. Certain groups already mentioned, such as Roma and migrants, have often unfairly been blamed for all sorts of calamities, including at present utterly groundlessly for the spreading of the COVID-19 virus. The reality is that these groups have not caused, but been the foremost victims of the COVID-19 crisis, have faced great difficulties, extended lockdowns in satisfying even the most elementary needs, including access to base health care, food, and clean water. In the statement issued in May, ECRI noted that the negative consequences of the pandemic are often disproportionately affecting minority groups. These consequences have frequently been made worse by inaction or misguided actions by certain authorities, as well as by hate speech by certain actors in society. ECRI, amongst others, stated that these hardships are deepening with the COVID-19 pandemic and the exclusion of the most vulnerable people will further intensify if governments do not take action to meet their specific needs and counter anti-Roma and anti-migrant hate speech and violence as a matter of urgency. Today, the situation is even worse. There are other vulnerable groups under attack in other circumstances and settings, often in social media, but in other fora too 
Often hate speech is more prevalent in certain situations, such as election campaigns, when certain politicians try to profit politically from engaging in hate speech, hoping for electoral support from certain segments of society. For example, various election campaigns held in recent years showed that ultra-nationalistic, xenophobic, LGBTI-phobic hate speech was once again on the rise and increasingly permits, and in many cases even sets the tone in social media networks. Unfortunately, it is not only individuals or certain groups in general society which make themselves guilty of hate speech. Sometimes it is the very institutions which are meant to protect all people and groups in society including minorities, which make themselves guilty of racism. In the aftermath of the tragic death of George Floyd upon apprehension by the police in late May 2020 in Minneapolis, US, which triggered a wave of protest against racism across the world, including such in the ranks of police forces, ECRI adopted an exceptional public statement during our 82nd plenary meeting in early July. In the statement, we as ECRI referred to the many accounts we have heard in our monitoring work in Europe of racist police abuse, including racial profiling and acts of violence toward minority groups or migrants. Unfortunately, the suspension last week of some 30 German police officers suspected of exchanging far-right propaganda online shows that, to put it mildly, there is much more to be done to implement ECRI's recommendations. The abusive exchanging featuring fictive abuse of refugees in WhatsApp chat groups, which occurred in the Western Germany state of North Rhine-Westphalia, where 11 of the police officers reportedly face actually criminal charges right now. The fact is that the case was detected and is being prosecuted shows that the German authorities stand ready to stop and pursue such repulsive actions. To avoid such occurrences, ECRI urged Council of Europe member states to take action, for instance, by developing recruitment procedures which ensure that the composition of the police reflects the diversity of the population, putting in place frameworks for dialogue between the police and members of minority groups, what Michael O'Flaherty mentioned earlier as building trust, improving reporting procedures within the police and establishing fully independent bodies to investigate incident, incidents of alleged police abuse. Notwithstanding such blatant abuse, as was revealed last week in Germany, we all know that in a broader societal context, there is a fine balance to be struck between allowing free speech, which is a cornerstone of democracy and protected by the European Court of Human Rights, the European Convention of Human Rights, Article 10, and fighting hate speech. Indeed, as pointed out by Director General um, Samarjis Markovic a moment ago, the Council of Europe has been working for decades on finding the right balance between protecting freedom of expression and protecting the victims of hate speech. One central actor in determining this delicate borderline is the European Court for Human Rights and its case law, which keeps growing over time. Some of the most relevant case law is quite recent, such as the landmark judgment of 14th January 2020, in the case of Bezaras and Levitas versus Lithuania, which concerns hate speech comments posted on Facebook. Social media has made it easier than ever before to express one's opinion, and that is in the overwhelming majority of cases a good thing, stimulating societal debate. However, there is a minority of users who abuse social media. Given the massive volume of statements and exchanges uh, feeling social media, it is obviously not an easy task for anyone to supervise the content. In it. Indeed, in the context of our country monitoring, we as ECRI have found that member states are struggling to address hate speech, in particular online, and that while there are many different approaches, few have real impact. The the extent of the liability of providers of social media platforms or news platforms when it comes to publishing what does or could amount to hate speech is a subject of debate and sufficiently detailed legislation is lacking in most countries. Ambassador Jos Durma, Special Envoy on Religion and Belief at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs in a recent online debate 
hosted by the aforementioned ministry, expressed his view that while it is easy to criticize social media companies, it is actually very difficult to completely prevent hate speech online and that social media companies are actually investing a lot into addressing this problem. This may partly be because these companies have realized that it is commercially necessary to tackle hate speech because they may otherwise lose advertisement revenue from large companies who do not want to be associated with tolerance towards hate speech. As we have seen, there are indisputably challenges, not to say right out big problems with hate speech online. As they say, bad habits die hard. We therefore need to think even more long term. The foundations for individual views of the world perceptions, opinions and attitudes are formed early in life. This is why it is so essential to form them in the right tolerant mood. This is why we need inclusive school education to tackle hate speech, including online as at its roots, and to build up equal and diverse societies. Also here, ECRI can offer guidance in the form of general policy recommendation number 10 on combating racism in and through school education. I would like to conclude by saying that it sometimes takes a good crisis to bring things forward. This year, with COVID-19 and the institutional racism revealed in some institutions, including police forces, as well as the backlash against LGBTI rights in some European countries, what we have left is no shortage of crisis to prompt us into action. Let us together rise to the challenge and push for more equal, inclusive, and tolerant societies, including online. Thank you very much. I thank Mrs. Uh, Maruda for her very insightful presentation, adding well-needed specificity and detail to the, to, for us to understand the gravity of the situation and possible ways out. Thank you, Mrs. Maruda, and I now give the floor to Mr. Christoph Kamm, Director of the Office of the High Commissioner on National Minorities. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, please allow me first to thank the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues, Fernanda Varenne, and the other organizers of the European Regional Forum on Minority Issues for providing an important and much needed platform to discuss and propose concrete recommendations to concerns related to minority rights and inter-ethnic relations. As you may know, the OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities is an instrument of conflict prevention mandated to assist the OSCE participating states in their efforts to avoid inter-ethnic tensions from turning into conflict. In addition to providing early warning at the first sign of conflict, the High Commissioner provides legal and policy advice to promote sustainable integration of diverse societies. The Office also implements targeted programs and disseminates a rich compilation of thematic recommendations and guidelines on national minority issues related to, amongst others, education rights, language rights, participation in public life, multi-ethnic policing, media, and interstate relations. The focus of this year's European Regional Forum on Minority Issues is on hate speech and the role that social media plays in this. The role of social media in diverse societies is a matter to which my office has devoted significant attention in the past few years. In February 2019, the then High Commissioner Lamberto Zanier launched the Tallinn Guidelines on National Minorities and the Media in the Digital Age. These guidelines advise states on how to use media, and in particular digital media, as a tool for conflict prevention and societal integration. They are based on the premise that states need to honor their international commitments to ensure that there is a favorable environment for freedom of expression and participation in public debate for everyone, that everyone can participate in that debate in an equitable and fair way, and that they can do so freely, safety, and without fear. As such, they articulate a series of concrete recommendations on how to shape a media landscape that promotes multilingualism, participation, and representation of all groups in society, including minorities. Based on this experience, I'm happy to share some observations and thoughts. Fundamental transformations have taken place in the media landscape in the last decade. 
new technologies have enriched the media with a proliferation of new platforms alongside the more traditional outlets. That has meant enhanced opportunities to generate and access an abundance of diverse content and increased tools for individualized and interactive participation in public debate. While such changes have affected the lives of everyone, they have impacted diverse societies in specific ways. The increased ability of the new media to disseminate information and reach and connect people has offered all groups in society, including minorities, opportunities to shape distinct identities and present and explore different viewpoints. The existence of multiple, often freely accessible platforms can boost empowerment, participation and representation of individuals belonging to minority communities. New media also provided tools to support and promote multilingualism. As the media increasingly transcends national borders, minorities and other diverse groups can easily form and rely on transnational information networks. At the same time, however, these developments also pose risks for peace and stability. Traditional transnational media networks have the potential to interfere in bilateral relations and sometimes in integration processes. As we are seeing, social media platforms can be used to exploit or fuel inter-ethnic divisions. And this brings me to the core of this discussion. Social media provides a tremendously efficient vehicle for spreading, echoing and amplifying the inflammatory, xenophobic and racist language that is increasingly permeating political discourse globally. In that sense, social media can be seen not only as a mirror of society, but also as a magnifier of some of its worst traits. Minorities and other vulnerable groups are an easy target, often instrumentalized to serve specific political agendas or scapegoated as enemies of the nation, often conceived and presented as a homogeneous, exclusive mono-ethnic entity. Unfortunately, it can be just a few short steps from expressions of discrimination and hatred on social media to actual violence in the real world and hence to atrocity crimes. As we know, crises, including conflict and political instability, humanitarian emergencies or economic recessions can exacerbate discrimination and hatred and divide already fragile societies even further. In the past years, successive immigration waves into Europe have spurred strong anti-immigrant and often anti-Muslim sentiments and anti-Semitism is also on the rise. Most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic has provided fertile ground for discrimination against vulnerable groups. Especially in the first phase of the pandemic, there were many reported cases of members of national minorities being accused of spreading the virus. This is one of the factors that motivated Ambassador Sanjay to issue a set of recommendations on how states could ensure that their responses to COVID-19 would take the need of everyone in society into account. As part of these recommendations, Zanye urged authorities to be especially vigilant in monitoring and combating instances of intolerance and xenophobia and other forms of otherization based on identity, ethnicity, language, region or culture. Specifically on the media, he recommended that they invest in shared media spaces for minorities and majorities to provide trustworthy sources of information. Such approaches would help turn a crisis that carries the risk of fragmentation into an opportunity to foster social cohesion. The issue of discrimination and hate speech does not start nor end with social media. The response should therefore also take a much broader approach that attempts to tackle the root causes of inter-ethnic tension and foster social integration. With its recommendations and guidelines covering a number of policy areas relevant to minority rights and inter-ethnic relations, the Office of the High Commissioner on National Minorities has a wealth of experience in designing and promoting such approaches and assisting the OSE participating states in adapting them to local contexts. Social media can and should help us recognize and identify early warning signs of inter-ethnic tension and atrocity crimes, such as instances of hate speech. Monitoring trends in hate speech and hate crime is a first step to addressing the issue. Negative narratives and stereotypes can be challenged on social media. Political and religious leaders have an important role to play in sharing positive messages. Effort should be directed at creating inclusive media spaces, an ingredient of any democratic and inclusive society. However, we should not forget that conflict and human rights abuses are the result of creeping long-term processes and of the conditions that help them thrive. Looking at society as a whole and taking a multi-phased and long-term approach that protects minority rights 
and promotes inclusion in a number of spheres of public life is, in the experience of successive High Commissioners, the best recipe for peace and stability. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Uh, Kamp, for your statement, reminding us uh, of uh, the High Commissioner's recommendation, so many minorities employ uh, to better claim their rights. And now I give the floor to Mrs. Katarzyna Gardafadze, first Deputy Director, OSC Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. I am not muted anymore, no? Thank you. So thank you very much, Director Biro, and, um, and uh, thank you for organizing this very important discussion and for inviting me to speak uh, here today, as always being uh, called to speak after so many distinguished speakers uh, causes a risk that everybody has already said everything uh, that you wanted to say. So let me focus on um, a little bit of a different angle of uh, the topic of today's discussion. And let me start by a reflection that I think the entire humanity is now falling victim to our global digital success. Um, and that's because humans are no longer in full control of content distribution in the digital space because we have given large parts of this control to algorithms. And as we all know, algorithms were not designed with moral and ethical principles in mind. The primary considerations were user engagement and clickability because this is what generates profit. And that's why algorithms filter and amplify for us the content that will keep us engaged for the longest possible time. In a sense, you could say that they feed our digital addiction. And if you don't believe it, try not opening Google and your social media for one week. And why does it matter for our today's discussion? It matters because this digital reality makes it frighteningly easy to prey on people's uncertainties, anxieties, and lack of information on a scale never seen before. To frame the debate around repeated appeals to our most primal emotions, such as fear, turning them into anger and blame. To spread and amplify hate speech and associated disinformation, peddling negative stereotypes and conspiracy theories that incite hatred, leading to violence, and to scapegoat and stigmatize individuals and entire groups. As already mentioned by several speakers today, none of this is new. Uh, for years, people have voiced concerns about the widespread use of social media platforms and digital technologies to disseminate hate, leading to discrimination, violence, and killings. And of course, the most striking example is the plight of the Rohingya people, uh, but there are hundreds of others. And just recently, if you recall, uh, the killing in uh, Kenosha town uh, in the United States of America were preceded by 455 complaints about hate speech and violent content to Facebook, uh, to which the response was that uh, these complaints do not violate um, the, uh, the platform's policy. And this was on the day of the killing. And then the um, Facebook reaction was, case, was called uh, by its founder an operational mistake. We have human interaction that is augmented by algorithms. We have bots and conversational artificial intelligence, and all of this allows hate, hate to spread like a virus, poisoning the political narrative, drawing in both like-minded and unsuspecting individuals, and disproportionately reinforcing, and what's scary for some people, normalizing the message of intolerance of hate. And as mentioned already uh, by previous speakers, what has been happening during the COVID-19 pandemic is just a magnified version of this reality. We have recently issued a report about the effects of states of emergency or similar measures introduced during the pandemic on democracy and human rights. And we saw all these symptoms amplified. We saw that people in marginalized or vulnerable situations 
such as ethnic, national, and religious minorities, migrants, and refugees are particularly affected. And I hear colleagues from partner organizations stating the same. Now, violence and killings do not appear out of nowhere. In, our concept, in your concept note for this event, you quoted the alarming statistics of hate crimes against minorities from our annual hate crime report. At ODIR, we say that hate crimes are message crimes. They are a manifestation of hatred and discrimination against the group or community to which the victim belongs or is perceived to belong. It's like Dr. Marian Turski said in his famous speech at the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. Violence creeps up word by word, step by step, comes closer until what has been unthinkable before becomes a deadly reality. I want to speak a little bit about what spreading hate speech on social media does to the fabric of our societies and to the political discourse. In the political science, there is a concept named the Overton window or the window of political discourse. At the center of the window are mainstream ideas, socially acceptable political lines and policies. At the outer edge, sit radical lines of debate that are starting to permeate small sections of society. And outside the window, there are things that are socially unspeakable. But when hate speech is aired publicly, it becomes normalized. The Overton window, so the range of ideas that are tolerated in public discourse, shifts. For example, when white supremacists call for violence against people of color, then more moderate, subtle forms of racism appear somewhat reasonable in comparison. There was a recent study in Poland that found that exposure to hostile online content against specific minority groups increases people's prejudices. And it does so because it desensitizes people to the plight of these minority groups. When key political figures speak about banning Muslims from their countries, when they compare refugees to a plague or announce the creation of LGTB free zones, the internet built to reward engagement and clickability over accuracy shifts the overtone window quickly and the socially unspeakable becomes mainstream. And if this continues, we are on a path to digital dystopia. Now, we talked, previous speakers talked about the universal rights to freedom of opinion and expression. And of course, this, these rights should complement and reinforce other human rights to safeguard the core values of non-discrimination. But we see, and I think we need to face it, that human rights no longer advance together as part of a single, indivisible and interrelated framework. Freedom of expression is far too often abused to stir up hatred and destroy other rights and freedoms. So now the solution of, to this uh, is discussed on many fora. And some people say that a response to all this is more self-regulation of digital companies. But civil society organizations and others have been alerting us that various voluntary mechanisms attempted so far have not yet worked as they should. In the law, there is an old saying, your liberty to swing your fist ends just where my nose begins. And it basically says uh, that um, your right to exercise whatever liberty you think you're entitled to ends when it threatens my life and safety. So if we measure uh, tech companies' answers to racial and ethnical hate, conspiracy theories, and outright violence that roam across their platforms and lead to people being killed. Against this principle, we find that these answers are often highly inadequate and frankly, often irresponsible, as for example, in the case of Kinosha. Now, there are others who say that we need more state control of the digital space. But I do think that in absence of a clear internationally agreed definition of hate speech, the debates about the boundaries between free expression and content control are going to be perennial and unlikely to bring us to the results we need. And it's worth noting that in this void, tech companies have an unconstrained power 
to decide what content is harmful and what is not without any legal accountability for how their decisions affect the rights and freedoms of billions of people. So in my opinion, um, and also backed by experience from other fields such as elections, we need to, build, to prioritize building a system of shared responsibility. Shared responsibility that includes tech companies, state institutions, businesses, international and civil society organizations, academia and others for the inclusive, effective oversight of tech companies and for dealing with the misuse and abuse of the digital space for propagating hate. Such proposals have been on the table for a while and I think they're very worth uh, looking at it and considering. What we also need, I believe, uh, hate, uh, human rights education was mentioned. I think that alongside human rights education, we need to prioritize a massive investment in educating people in emotional intelligence, critical and analytical thinking, and digital literacy. This needs to start from very early age, and it needs to use all formal and informal channels, because only with such an investment, we will be able to build people's resilience to the virus of hate speech and counter insensitivity and complacency. And let me perhaps conclude with, uh, what Marian Turski again said in Auschwitz, that he said that if people become insensitive and complacent, before we know it, some kind of Auschwitz would suddenly appear out of nowhere and befall us and our descendants. Thank you very much. Director Biro, I think now you are muted. There you go. Thank you very much for reminding me to unmute myself. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, um, Mrs. Uh, Katarzyna Gardapadze, you certainly had loads of new ideas to add to what was said before. Um, it was a very inspirational speech, especially highlighting how social media behaves. Uh, and uh, how hate speech can spread uh, from uh, little pockets uh, into the mainstream. Thank you very much again for your inspirational speech. And now I will turn uh, to our last speaker, Dr. Fernand de Varenne, UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues. Thank you. You cannot see me yet, can you? There we go. Thank you, Anna Maria. Your Excellency, Minister Schallenberg, Madame Sabanich Markovic, Director General of Democracy at the Council of Europe, Madame Van Hout, OATHR Regional Representative, Mr. O'Flaherty, Director of the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, Madame Maruda, Chair of the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, Mr. Camp, Director of the OHEHR Office, and Madame Gardat Haze, First Deputy Director of the OSCE Office for Democracy, Democratic Institutions, and Human Rights. And of course, uh, distinguished guests, experts, and participants. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour, guten tag, dobre dia. Welcome to the first online regional forum for Europe on hate speech, social media, and minorities. Now, before I begin, please allow me first to express my gratitude to the Tom Lantos Institute and my thanks to the Foreign Ministry of the Republic of Austria for supporting this regional forum, which, like many others, um, faces many challenges because of the pandemic disruptions we have all been experiencing worldwide. Many others have made this event possible and I'll be thanking them more formally at the end of the forum tomorrow. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I announced in my first report to the UN General Assembly in 2017 that hate speech, social media and minorities 
was one of the four thematic priorities of my new mandate. At the 2018 UN Forum on Minority Issues in Geneva, I also announced that regional forums would be organized from 2019 to make the UN Forum more accessible and responsive to regional contexts and realities. And last year, we held three regional forums for Africa, Asia, and Europe on the issue of education language and the human rights of minorities. This year, the coronavirus uh, pandemic has meant that we can only hold two of the four expected region, regional forums we were hoping uh, to have um, because of the unfortunate situation. Obviously, these four forums have not been possible. Because we're facing one of the greatest challenges the world uh, has known, we do have challenges such as the environmental climatic change situation, the pandemic, obviously, poverty, which is increasing around the world. But we are also facing a virus of the mind, which is infecting hundreds of millions of people and poisoning societies with misinformation, disinformation, and hate and which we still seem to be unable to halt or even perhaps slow down to any significant degree. Last year, UN Gen Secretary General Antonio Guterres, when announcing the United Nations strategy and plan of action on hate speech, warned us that around the world, we're seeing a disturbing groundswell of xenophobia, racism, and intolerance, including rising anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim hatred and persecution of Christians. Social media and other forms of communication are being exploited as platforms for bigotry. Neo-Nazi and white supremacy movements are on the march. Public discourse is being weaponized for political gain with incendiary rhetoric that stigmatizes and dehumanizes minorities, migrants, refugees, women, and in fact, any other so-called uh, other. Minority women, we've heard also on a number of occasions, can be doubly targeted for some of the vilest, most violent hate speech through social media. And just as the pandemic does not affect everyone the same, hate speech does not target everyone equally in society. Data from some European countries show that religious, ethnic, and linguistic minorities are the main targets of hate speech. In some countries, more than 80%, 80% of hate speech target Jews, Muslims, Roma, travelers, and other minorities. And contrary to widely held views, hate speech is not limited to immigrants or refugees. I want to emphasize this. On the contrary, and I would add, unfortunately, it's also quite often widespread against national minorities, more traditional minorities in certain countries, where there may be nationalistic views that a state belongs or should reflect mainly, if not exclusively, the identity and cult uh, culture of a titular ethnic majority. And intolerance and stereotypes are being amplified and even to some extent in some countries, as we've heard also, normalized. But I think we need to be absolutely clear here. It's not accurate to say that minorities are often the target of hate speech. They are the targets most of the time, not just often or sometimes. In the vast majority of case, hate speech targets minorities mainly. And unfortunately, again, hate speech is too often followed by hate crimes and violence. We've seen it with increased attacks on immigrants, Roma, and other minorities. And among the key findings of the 2018 hate crime data uh, of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe is that more than 76% of hate crimes involved Jewish, Muslim, Roma, and other minorities. In some parts of the world, it's also plain, if we think of the Rohingya, who, who were mentioned earlier, the Rohingya in Myanmar, 
that hate speech in social media against minorities has prepared the ground for the dehumanization and scapegoating of minorities as precursors for crimes against humanity and even what has been characterized as attempted genocide. These are some of the concrete consequences of hate speech in some countries in social media when it targets minorities in the most horrible, horrific ways. But that's where we're at. The targets of hate speech are almost always minorities, but not all governments collect disaggregated data on hate speech. So that this is not always as clear as it should be. Um, it, was, um, it was good to hear from the Council of Europe, for example, that it is working on setting up efficient disaggregated data collection in several Council of Europe member states to address this challenge. Though given the scale of hate speech against minorities in social media, it should be hoped that all member states are encouraged to move in this direction. As Foreign Minister Schallenberg uh, reminded, us, reminded us earlier this morning, we have unfortunately been here before. The horrors and the destruction of the Second World War flowed from the darkest abyss of racial hate and discrimination against minorities. And the lesson we should have learned is that the demonization and dehumanization uh, of minorities can lead to the worst excesses of hate violence and even genocide against minorities. This needs to be raised, it needs to be emphasized, and it needs to be explicitly acknowledged. Any toolbox of measures to address hate speech must include tools specifically where hate speech is most encountered, and that's against minorities. The virus of hate will not disappear by itself. Its spread has to be prevented. The virus itself has to be tackled and it has to be tackled where it can be addressed in relation to social media platforms themselves, whilst respecting the requirements of freedom of expression as recognized in legally binding treaties. We have to recognize the nature of the beast if we're to be able to resist and control it. And we have to emphasize, to focus on who the main victims are, minorities. I note with interest in this regard the definition of hate speech adopted in 2015 by the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance and the additional protocol also of the, uh, of the Council of Europe to the Convention on Cybercrime, Cybercrime concerning the criminalization of acts of a racist and xenophobic nature committed through computer systems. And I also know the recent legislative and other measures to fight against hate speech targeting minorities, which was mentioned by the Austrian foreign minister. These are good practices. There are others which could be mentioned, such as the Rabat plan of action. Now, we also have to ask hard questions, and that is part of the exercise of these regional forums. Is it enough in Europe to mainly call on social media companies to, to do more than flag or remove racist, misogynist, and other harmful content. Should they also be held financially liable in some cases as our traditional media? What is the scale of hate speech in European countries, particularly against minorities? We actually don't still know. And is this sufficiently set out today in, av in available disaggregated data or does it hide or camouflage the extent of hate speech against Jews, Muslims, Roma, and other mi minorities. Are all institutions working on hate speech in social media identif identifying, recognizing who are the targets, and especially who are the main minority targets? And finally, part of the exercise of the regional forum, such as this one, is, and I have to emphasize this, to hear the voices and learn of the experiences and exper expertise in different parts of the world, which is not always the case, we have to admit, when we hold events of only a few days in, at the United Nations in Geneva. So this is what um, you are invited to reflect on. Uh, we'll now uh, shortly, I believe, be explaining the process and expectations for the regional forum shortly. Um, and I remind you of some of the specific objectives for this event as outlined in the concept note, but I think we perhaps still have a speaker 
to hear before we complete uh, to this morning yeah. session. Merci beaucoup. Yes. Thank you and good deliberation. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Fernand, and uh, my apologies. You were not the last speaker, but you can be the last speak speaker after um, we listen to Mr. Guillerme Canela, uh, Chief of uh, Freedom of Expression and Safety of German, uh, Journalism Section of UNESCO. Uh, apologies, um, Mr. Canela. I will pass the microphone to you now, then I will get back to you, Fernand, if you have anything to add, and then indeed I will get to uh, practical information. Mr. Canela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you, Director Bureau, distinguished guests, Mr. Special Rapporteur, experts, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Although I'm very pleased to join you on behalf of UNESCO, I must say that sad are the times when we still need to talk about the issue of hate. I would prefer that, just as in that Emily Dixon poem, we all could say, I have no time to hate. Yet, here we are. These are complex and serious issues, as we heard this morning, and silver bullets to address them are rarely available. I'm therefore very thankful to the organizers for the opportunity to discuss how we can tackle hate speech without unnecessarily limiting the human rights that also hold the key to fighting this huge problem. Throughout the history of human rights violations and atrocities, we see a common pattern. Perpetrators first dehumanize those groups whose rights they wish to violate. They didn't torture women in medieval ages, they tortured witches. They didn't commit atrocities against men, women, and children in the plantations. They did that against slaves. To, dehuman to dehumanize an individual or a group, it's necessary first to build a narrative of hate against them. Hate speech is the initial step to further human rights violations, as was already said for, by many speakers. There is hate against the unknown. There is hate against the different. There is hate against the other. There is hate to amplify or keep power. That's why we see hateful discourses peak around times of crisis, change, and hardship. At times when accurate information is scarce, and people are searching for answers on how to solve problems. We see this happening over and over again in times of elections, and now on an unprecedented scale as we are tackling this pandemic. With this in mind, allow me very briefly to share a few key elements, trying to offer some inputs for the working groups, which will discuss these issues in detail today and tomorrow, as I understood it. First, we need to acknowledge that there are key stakeholders with an important role to play to counter hate speech. These include journalists. Reliable information is essential here. Judicial operators applying international human rights standards when dealing with hate speech cases is paramount. Internet platforms, since no scalable solution is possible without them. And all of us, regular citizens, no long-term solution is possible without empowering everyone. With education, information, transparency, accountability, and the tools both to detect hate, hateful narratives and content, as well as to understand how to navigate the various pitfalls of unnecessary restrictions, these stakeholders can together turn the tide of our public discourse. As international institutions, policymakers, civil society, and research institutions, our role is to figure out how to enable this collective effort. As we know, it is difficult to gauge the full extent of hate speech online or the effective, effectiveness of response to hate speech due to num numerous factors that were underlined this morning. Improving our understanding is nevertheless indispensable and we will, it will increase in urgency as the advancement of artificial intelligence brings additional challenges and opportunities. 
Therefore, for evidence-based policymaking, transparency is essential, particularly transparency regarding how hate speech spreads within social media platforms and how they are dealing with this phenomenon. Unfortunately, we are not there yet and much greater progress is needed. As Birgit and others already underlined, another challenge in tackling hate speech is the lack of a universally accepted definition. For guidance here, we must turn to international human rights law and standards, particularly in regards to illegal hate speech. Uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights was already mentioned, the Rabat Plan, action, uh, plan of Action as well. Regulatory, self-regulatory and co-regulatory laws, policies and codes of practice to counter hate speech have been on the rise and it's fundamental that the adoption and implementation of these laws align with international standards. I would like to emphasize a point from the UN strategy and plan of action uh, against hate speech. The most effective method for countering hate speech is through more speech, not less. Therefore, a commitment is necessary by all stakeholders to a human rights-based, open, accessible, and most stakeholder governed internet. This is in line with UNESCO framework of internet universality. So what can we do? Curtailing harmful content through blanket regulations or automated, automated process is tempting, but rarely the best approach. Such gen gener generic regulations are blunt tools that often directly backfire against the very groups that are targets of hate speech. The UNESCO report countering online hate speech finds that laws and regulation on this top risk on this topic risk being overly broad and that social and non-regulatory responses may often be preferable to that to this kind of regulations. These approaches inform the work of UNESCO, which is the UN agency with the mandate to promote both freedom of expression and quality of education for all. For example, our project on building trust in media in Southeast Europe with the support of the European Commission has a twofold strategy to address potential harmful content online. The first is to support the media and their commitment to professional standards and media self-regulation. And secondly, the project reinforces the critical thinking of citizens through piloting media and information literacy in schools and youth organizations. And as was already said, media and information literacy is also a key part of many of our strategies, or should be, is in another UNESCO project in cooperation with the European Commission Twitter and the World Jewish Congress on the related problem of conspiracy theories. The project just launched an awareness raising campaign of the existence and consequences of conspiracy theories linked to COVID-19 crisis. A further area of combating hate speech while respecting human rights or the other human rights is through UNESCO Judges Initiative, which has empowered more than 17,000 judicial operators across Latin America and Africa. This, get, this has given them the knowledge to make rulings in line with international standards, for example, in applying the six-part threshold test of the Rabat Plan of Action. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that these remarks will add some reflections for the thematic working groups and the recommendations that they will produce over the coming uh, two days. In your discussions on this topic, I invite you to keep in mind the words of Martin Luther King Jr. Darkness cannot drive out of darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out of hate. Only love can do that. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, for your inspiring uh, speech and the end quote. I think it is a good way to conclude um, this part of the session as uh, um, the special reporter signaled that he had nothing to add. Thank you very much to all keynote speakers for their very important spe uh, speeches, presentations, and uh, now I will proceed uh, to present you the rules of uh, proceedings. Participants of the regional forum 
are reminded to contribute constructively to the discussions along the themes addressed in the program of work of the regional forum. Please note that all interventions and statements on the each theme of the regional forum should be relevant to that particular theme. It is preferred that speakers are not interrupted, so we ask you to make sure that your statements relate to the topics under discussion. It is encouraged that all participants provide concrete recommendations on how to tackle the issues under the theme. In order to attain fruitful and meaningful exchanges, we expect that all participants show respect for others' views. We invite all participants to exercise the forum, avoid abusive or disrespectful language or derogatory and inflammatory remarks, respect UN core values and principles, and uphold UN standards when referring to countries and territories. Now I shall turn to the process of the regional forum. Objective. The purpose of this meeting is to formulate regional recommendations, which will inform the 13th UN Forum on Minority Issues. This meeting is organized around four thematic sessions around which recommendations will be produced. Each thematic session will start with presentations of 10 minutes from each expert. Following the presentations, the floor will be open for interventions during which participants will be able to make statements and propose recommendations. To allow for broad participation, interventions are limited to two minutes. Participants wishing to speak can raise their hands at the beginning of each thematic session. So please, be aware of the fact that this will be an automated speakers list by Zoom. The moderators will communicate to participants if there will be a second round of interventions after, the, after everyone spoke at least once. Participants are required to remain muted with their camera disabled at all times during the meeting, except when taking the floor. This will ensure the best possible sound quality for all meeting participants. Participants wishing to speak must indicate this to the moderator using the raise hand function in Zoom and wait for the floor to be given to them by the moderator. The moderator will give the floor to participants order that hands were raised. Once the moderator hands the floor to a participant, the speaker must unmute themselves and turn on the camera before taking the floor. After the intervention is finished, the speaker mutes themselves and disables their cameras. There are no rights of reply or points of order during the regional forum. All participants wishing to make a statement or intervention must follow the protocol detailed above. We ask that all participants that wish to propose recommendations do so by submitting them via the Zoom chat function. This includes those recommendations proposed during an intervention to ensure they are incorporated into the final output document. All proposed recommendations submitted in writing will be collated by the organizers. During the final session tomorrow, presentation of recommendations is um, in the agenda. A final list of recommendations will be made available for all participants to view via the shared screen Zoom function. Participants that wish to comment on a specific recommendation should use the Zoom chat function to send their comment, referring to the specific recommendation number, as will be shown on the screen. The UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues will ultimately make the final decision on the final set of recommendations, taking into account the comments provided. 
please be aware that the regional forum is being live streamed on YouTube and the video and audio recording will be publicly available on the Tom Lantosh Institute's YouTube channel, website and on www.minorityforuminfo um, hyperlink. Finally, the special reporter on minority issues will be available for one hour at the end of each day of the regional forum for media inquiries. All media inquiries should be sent to his office via Mrs. Marina Narvaez Guarnieri or Mrs. Ki Kyung Yu. Their email addresses will be posted in the chat function. For more details and information on the process of the regional forum and on using the Zoom features, I would refer you to the practical information document and Zoom guide, which have been sent to you and are available on the regional forum website. This brings to an end this opening session. I would again like to thank all our distinguished keynote speakers for their statement. We shall have a lunch break now, followed by the first thematic session to begin at 13 hours Central European summer time. Have a nice lunch and see you soon. <laughs>